Welcome, everybody, to a very chill, perhaps too chill. Let me turn that down. DCP Live Session 4. Uh, I am the producer of the DCP podcast, Luke Payne. I'm joined by our esteemed hosts, Jared Atkinson and Johnny Johnson. I uh, just wanted to catch you up on a few things that have been going on. Last week, we released uh, a full form podcast episode with our friend Olaf, who, interesting enough, was the first guest ever for episode one of the podcast back when we started it a few years ago. So we had him back and kind of had some refreshed conversations. Um, we also have a podcast coming up uh, with Maxime from Lima Charlie. Uh, he's a founder, correct me if I'm wrong, Jared, he's a co-founder of Lima Charlie. Um, we noticed a little something when we were reviewing our stats on the podcast platforms, which is we tend to lose uh, listeners around 33 to 40 minutes, and we have hour and a half episodes. So what we're going to try for a little bit is to split each of the hour and a half interviews into two. Uh, so part one is going to release next week. Then the week after, we have another DCP live session, and then you'll get part two after that, just to keep the content spread out uh, and keep everybody engaged. So if you think that's a good idea, let us know. If you think it's a bad idea, let us know. Uh, but yeah, welcome to session four, and I will pass it to the guy. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Luke. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to m45co7 saying let's go got gave us a little bit of an early shout out so we appreciate you thanks for thanks for joining the the live stream tonight uh so the past the past couple live streams we talked about securable objects we talked about access rights and tonight we're going to kind of bring that all together we're going to talk about api functions and we're going to specifically use those api functions to build a tool um, we're going to demonstrate how a developer might go about implementing an attack technique uh, to do that, we're going to focus on an attack technique called access token manipulation, specifically token impersonation. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of implement one variation of the get system command. So if you've ever used Meterpreter or Cobalt Strike or any of these tools, you're probably PowerSploit. You're probably familiar with something like a get system. And generally speaking, what that, that allows you to do is take over the NT authority system user context. So what we're going to do is we're going to explore how a developer might take that idea, I want to act in the context of NT authority system, and we're going to show how that actually can be implemented as a tool and why securable objects and access rights are particularly important. I don't know, Johnny, if you wanted to add anything before we jump into it. No, uh, the only thing is that, um, so we are going to go over one variation of this, you know, in the next live session, we're actually going to be looking at alternatives, um, kind of just building off of what we go over today. Um, what we've talked about when it comes to securable objects are going to play a huge part in tonight. Um, and then we'll also we'll see some other cool newer, uh, maybe technology that we haven't talked about yet, like privileges. Um, and we'll, we'll touch base on those, but in a couple of episodes, we'll actually go a little bit deeper on, uh, privileges themselves. Cool. All right. Thanks, Johnny. So the, the, the first thing I want to talk about is how do you take this idea, which is I want to become the NT authority system user. For those that aren't familiar with, with Windows and the different user contexts and things like that, uh, NT authority system is kind of like the root, the root account on Windows. So on the root account on Linux become, is kind of equates to NT authority system on Windows. And what that means is that you're just acting on behalf of the computer itself as opposed to some user context uh, within it. And so the reason why an attacker might want to do that is generally speaking, the NT authority system account has access to different resources or securable objects on the system. And so you kind of would have access to all the files and all the directories and all the name pipes and all the services and all, all that kind of stuff. And so it kind of gives you uh, the key to anything on that particular system. Now, as now I have this idea, I'm a developer, right? I'm trying to build out this tool and what I, what I might do, just kind of my, when I'm developing um, an application, one of the first things that I do is I start to think about what APIs, application programming interface functions, would allow me to actually perform impersonation, right? I want to take over this account and I, I would want to figure that out, right? Um, to give you context, an API is something like a routine that's going to be that the operating system, in this case, Windows, makes available to developers, right? 
And so all operating systems are going to have um, some APIs and though there's going to be different things. So different repeatable tasks, things like creating a file. Creating a file on a computer is actually relatively com complicated, right? So you have to like know how the MFT works. You have to be able to write to a, to a physical drive as opposed to, you know, it's just software. And so you have to you have to work through that. And so a lot of developers don't take don't want to take the time or waste the time to figure that all out. And so instead they create an API function called create file that just kind of abstracts away all that complexity. Uh, shout out to Andrew. Sorry I'm late. No no worries, buddy. We're glad that you're here and we're happy you're excited. We're hoping hoping that you're going to enjoy what we what we got in store tonight. So so these API functions are basically our our interface as a developer into the operating system and into the different components that are connected to the operating system. Things like hard drives, things like webcams, things like uh, I don't know, I don't know what else, er everything else, right? So everything that the computer does has usually has some sort of API that we can interact with. Now what we're looking at here is I just did kind of a common Google search. Um, actually, j we we plan these episodes out. Kind of right, so it's not like we planned out everything that we're possibly going to say. But I was I was going for a walk today, and I I had a conversation with Johnny, and one of the things that I said is like we were walking through what the logical flow of this should look like, and I literally just said, "Can you type? Can you Google Windows Token Impersonation APIs and tell me what pops up?" And this is what this is what popped up, and it was exactly what we need to get started. So it's one of those things to where this isn't contrived. This is literally what I would have typed into Google. And we actually worked this out without me seeing the computer. So this is this is legit how we would go about figuring this out. Pause for a second in case, Johnny, you wanted to add anything. Yeah. So uh, it's it's like what Jared said is it's kind of funny that this just happened to work out this way. Um, it's one thing I will say, it's not always as simple when we go into them. And we uh, we probably won't jump into it tonight, but a lot of the APIs that we generally interact with that are exposed through Microsoft per se are going to be Win32 APIs. These are supported APIs by Microsoft because if they were to change, like Jared was saying, like these APIs are essentially just wrappers for undercover like technologies that do a lot of things underneath the hood. Um, and Microsoft splits out their APIs between things that they want to support and not support. Um, and not to dive too much into it um, right now, but what Jared is showing or about to show is going to be the supported way by which Microsoft wants you to go about impersonating, you know, some user or whatever it may be. Um, but there, when we talk about like separate variations, you can actually call the underlying functions themselves um, that are not supported. So yep. kind of keep that in mind there. Well, if you ever hear us mention like win 32 API or undocumented API, that's because there's various levels of depth in the abstraction of APIs. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that a little more in depth in a later episode. Yep, exactly. Thanks, Johnny. Okay, so when we search for Windows Token Impersonation API, so first of all, we just have to know that there's this thing called Token Impersonation, which allows us to take over the user context of some other other uh, account that's logged onto the system. Um, the first thing that pops up is this Impersonate Logged On User function. I think when we were talking about it on the call, we first saw this client impersonation. So I'm just going to open that so we get an idea of what's going on. So this, one of the cool things about documentation, one of the, the big uh, hurdles that people have to overcome is understanding how Microsoft documentation works. And as you become more familiar with it, it's going to become easier and easier to kind of look into things and, and kind of uh, grok what's going on. So as we look through this, it kind of describes what impersonation is. So it says it's the ability of a thread to execute using different security information that, than the process that owns the thread. So remember, a process is a securable object. It's a container. And usually the idea is, is when you have some software or some application and you double click on it to run it or you execute it on the command line, it's going that, that application is going to be run in memory in the context of a process. Now, there's a process is kind of viewed as a container. And that container has a number of what they call threads. And the threads are the things that are actually executing tasks, right? And so you, you may have heard of like a multi-threaded application. This is just something that can take advantage of multiple CPU cores at the same time and do different tasks simultaneously. So that's what, that's what threading allows you to do is kind of execute multiple things simultaneously. And it makes for a more uh, efficient app. As you get into programming, if you've ever, if anybody's ever done any type of programming, maybe they've interacted with like trying to write a GUI uh, like a graphical user interface application. And you'll have something to where you click a button and it's supposed to open up something else. And if you're running everything in a single thread, one of the things that you'll find is that the 
the uh, the original thread, which is the original GUI application, will freeze while the like secondary window is is running. And so that's something that kind of forces you to realize I need to I need to figure out how this threading stuff type starts to work, right? But in this case, we're going to be operating just kind of from a single threaded perspective. Okay, so we see that there's actually a number of different ways. And this, as as an attacker, you might be looking at this and start to see a, that there's a number of different functions that allow you to do impersonation, right? And so we see DDE, impersonate client, impersonate name pipe client. That's something that maybe we'll explore in a different episode. But the one that we're really interested in today is impersonate logged on user, right? So this allows you to impersonate the security context of a logged on user's access token. And so we'll go ahead and I've already opened that up. And what we see is this function. And what I want to do is take a second to kind of dig into the documentation for a function because they kind of follow a standard uh, layout. And we'll use that to kind of understand what's going on here. So generally speaking, at the top, we see the name of the function. And that just kind of gives us the idea of what, what we're working with. And then we get a small uh, description of what the function does. Sometimes these descriptions are better. Sometimes they're worse. Sometimes it's like the impersonate logged on user function allows you to impersonate a logged on user. And you're like, oh, well, thanks for that, Microsoft. But sometimes it's sometimes it's better, right? So um, now the way that this works is we could read the syntax. And this tells the programmer how you should interact with this function. And the way to read this is the output type of the function. So when you run the function, there's going to be some output as a result of it. And that output is going to be a Boolean value. Now, for those that aren't familiar with Booleans or different data types, a Boolean is just a true false. So basically it returns true if the function ran successfully and it returns false if the function failed for whatever reason, for maybe you weren't able to impersonate the user. We see the name of the function and then we see the parameters, right? And for there, this one only has one parameter, but sometimes there's numerous parameters. And the way that we read this is generally speaking, the handle is the data type that we're expecting. And a handle is going to uh, kind of be a pointer to an object, right? Um, and a pointer is just a memory address, generally speaking. And then we have a kind of like a friendly name for what the different parameters are. And so in this case, we see that it's called H token. And there's just a naming convention that we're following here to where the H signifies the data type. So H corresponds with handle and it's it just is a quick way for a programmer to see, hey, this variable that I'm passing in is, is a handle, right? So it's just a quick way for us to see that. And then basically it's a handle to a token. Johnny, you wanna, I'll kind of keep pausing and giving you a chance to jump in. Yeah, I, I uh, wanna point out to everybody that the reason why Jared, like this seems very uh, straightforward, but the reason why we're going step by step through this is like reading Microsoft documentation in itself is a skill um and understanding like what they what they want for you um and what we were talking about earlier is when it comes to this api right and jerry's going to show this in a little bit but like really there's two values that we we really care about when it comes to impersonate logged on user right we have the input which is going to be a handle and then the return value which is going to let us know if that is successful or unsuccessful um it's important before developing any api to read the full documentation and we'll jump into that here in a moment. Like you think just after we read this H token parameter, we're good to go. There's actually a section at the very bottom that gives like explicit instructions for what is checked if this call is made and whether or not you'll be have access to appropriately call it. Cool, thank you. Okay, so moving on from the syntax section, now we now we get a little bit more details. So let's say you don't know what a, to what a token handle is, right? Well, they, they actually describe this to you. So they say, hey, here's a list of the parameters and we're going to give a description for each of the parameters. So here it says, hey, the H token parameter is a handle to a primary or impersonation access token. And you could double click on that or click on it and it'll take you to a description of what an access token in, to, uh, what an access token is. And it represents a logged on user, right? And so then it tells you, hey, you could, if you don't know how to get an access token, and this is usually quite helpful, right? And we'll talk about this in a second. If you, uh, a token handle can be returned by calling log on user, create restricted token, duplicate token, duplicate token EX, open process token, or open thread token. So there's a number of different ways that you might get this value. Um, and what we find is sometimes the parameters are things that you just inherently know, right? So uh, maybe it's asking you a question like, do you want something as a result of this? To like, uh, we'll find an example of this in the next, the next functions. Uh, but other times it's something that you have to bring to the table. And it's it's something that's not 
obvious, right? And so in this case, we actually have a dependency, right? You can't just call and personate logged on token, uh, logged on user. You have to first get a handle to a token. And what it's saying is if you want to get a handle to a token, there's a few different ways that you could get it. And all of those are going to work in different contexts. And we'll talk about which one we're, we're interested in. Okay. And then uh, this, this actually goes into the access rights that we talked about. So remember, it's, an access token is a securable object. And when you open a handle to a uh, securable object, you have to specify the access rights that you want. And so in this case, it says, if the uh, H token is a handle to a primary token, then you need the token query and token duplicate access. If it's a handle to an impersonation token, then you need token query and token impersonate access. And so that's going to dictate how we deal with that. Now, uh, generally speaking, just so we don't have to go down, a rabbit, down the rabbit hole, a primary token is going to be a token that's applied at the process level. And so generally speaking, what happens is every process has a token and that token represents the security context in which that process is running. So when somebody says, this process is running as Johnny. What, what that really means is that the, there's a token that represents Johnny's security context, which is applied to the process. And then when, when there's no impersonation happening, every thread inside that process is going to inherit that primary access token. Now, when somebody does something like calls impersonate logged on user, then we have a situation to where the process is running under the context of the primary token, but the thread that's performing impersonation is running under the context of the impersonation token. And so you just need to know kind of what type of token you're dealing with when you're trying to work through impersonation. Okay. So after we look at the parameters, we have the return value. And this is just saying, hey, if the function succeeds, then you have a non-zero return value. It's typically like going to be one or something like that. And if the function fails, then you're going to get a value that's zero. And if you want to know why it failed, you could call the get last error um, function. It's another API function. Johnny, I'll give you a sec to jump in. Nope, I don't have anything yet. OK, cool. And then last, uh, we well, not last, we have the remarks section. And this is going to just give you a lot of extra additional information. So for instance, um, impersonation, when you call impersonate logged on user, you're going to be in a state of impersonation, or your thread will be in a state of impersonation. and Impersonation is going to last until either the thread is terminated or exits, or until it calls revert to self, which is another function uh, that you could call. Okay. Now, um, you, the calling thread does not need to have any particular privileges to call impersonate logged on user. So it's telling us kind of what's the situation in which you might be able to do this. It's giving you just a bunch of information. And then lastly, we have the requirements section. So it's going to tell us what like basically when did this function come around so impersonate logged on user has been around with us since windows xp so for quite some time or windows server 2003 it's also going to tell us what dll exports this function or makes this function available so it's part of the adv api or advanced api 32 uh, dll and so that might be useful when we start to actually dig into trying to understand how this works that's something that we'll probably look at on the next episode the next live session okay okay so now we're back at the point to where we need to get this token. So we need to start looking at the dependencies. It's, and we could refer to the documentation here about the H token parameter. And you see that this, this link is purple, which kind of gives away uh, what I'm planning to do here. But we're, we're particularly interested in the open process token function. So again, open thread token might be useful uh, in the context of we're trying to grab an impersonation token. So we want to look at specifically what is the token associated with a given thread. But in this case, we're specifically interested in the process token, which is the primary token. And remember, that's going to be useful for us when we start to look at this section. What are the access rights that we need? Okay. Okay. So I've already opened it up and we're going to go and look at open process token, which is another function here. And what we see is that open process token, this is one of those not so great descriptions. The open process token function opens the access token associated with a process. Okay, so I guess self-explanatory is what they're what they're trying to tell us. And in this case, we we could read the syntax and we kind of see again we're getting a Boolean value, true or, true or false, right? But it has this time we have three different parameters. We see that we require a process handle, right? So again, this is something that we don't have just naturally, right? So we don't know what that is. Then we have the desired access, and we'll look at that in a second. And then we need uh, to pass in a token handle. So generally speaking, one one trick here. 
So when it says in, that means that you're passing a value in to the function and the function is going to do something with that value. Out just means give me a buffer, give me some, some space and memory, and I'm going to return something uh, to the parameter. So you have to kind of initialize a pointer. This, this stands for pointer to a handle. And then you pass it, you pass it into, the, into the function and the function is going to give you some value back as a result. So the Boolean says, hey, this succeeded or it failed. But this is actually the kind of the output that we're looking for, which is the token handle. I don't know if you want to add to that, Johnny. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so bef while Jerry goes through what the first parameter is for the process handle, um, can anyone uh, in the comment section maybe mention why the desired access is important here whenever we are accessing another object? Um, and maybe some things we can figure out of like how to find those, whatever that relates to and things like that. Another thing that's really cool about this as well like Jared was saying, it's very interesting when you start to write API or like deal with the APIs. It's like, well, you have a return value, which is the Boolean, right? But then you also have the output that you care about. And so like, theoretically, the API could have been like, it could have passed, but then you wouldn't have got, and you didn't get a handle correctly, or you, like the handle could be null. And so when developing these things, like as you'll see Jared do, um, he'll look for whether or not the handle is null or not, because before we can even continue, that needs to be non null. And yep. so like we care less about like, I mean, obviously we care if the open process token was successful, but that's really the key that we're looking for when moving forward. Um, and, I, so, yeah. and, and I want people to start thinking about um, the interaction. Like there's a chain of functions that's happening here. So we want to, I, I want to call impersonate logged on user. But in order to do that, I have to have something. I have to bring something to the table, right? And the way that I get that something that I could bring to the table is through calling open process token. And so open process token is going to output something that I'm going to then use as an input into the thing that I actually want to call, right? And so there's this relationship of functions that output things and functions that input things. Yep. Right. And some functions are outputters, inputters and outputters and other functions are just inputters, basically. And uh, as we're working through this, we should start to kind of see this chain that we're that we're building. And that's that's actually going to be very important. Probably a few sessions from now when we actually start to get into things like operations. Right. That's going to be something that we talk about further on. Um, but there's there's a few more things we need to talk to before talk about before we get there. Yeah, okay. and what, one last thing, sorry. And like what no Jerry's talking about, these chain of functions, it's important that our dip, uh, one of our dependencies, in this case for impersonate logged on users, open process token, open process token might have a dependency as well before we can move forward. And that might even have a dependency. So like what Jared's talking about is we can get lost in the chain of dependencies and forget like what maybe the goal is or the, the, the action we want to perform. And it's like, okay, yeah, I want to get back to this point here. And this is all just so I can be successful at this point. Yep, yep, yep. And sometimes you find that you have like 15 dependencies. It gets <laughs> kind of tiring. But yeah. okay, so let's uh, let's start talking about the parameter. So again, the process handle is going to be something that we need to get from somewhere else. We don't just know what the process handle is. And so we need a handle to a process whose access token is to be opened. So in this case, we're trying to impersonate the NT authority system account. And so what we need to do is we need to find a process that's running in the context of NT authority system. We're gonna we're gonna cheat just because that that would take too long for this episode. Um, generally speaking, the the primary target of NT author like of Git system is the win logon process. And there's a few reasons why that happens. And uh, actually, Justin Bowie, one of our former colleagues that's at SpectreOps, wrote a really good blog post exploring just why win logon is such a juicy target for for Git system and trying to figure out if there are any other targets that maybe aren't as interesting. So I'll give uh, Johnny and Luke a second to kind of see if they could pull that up uh, and share the URL maybe in one of the banners so that people can follow that. So if you're if you're interested in just like why we're going to target when log on and some descriptions about that, Justin's going to Justin did a much better job explaining that than than I would be able to just just right now. So I'll let I'll leave that to him and we could get into the uh, we could kind of skip that that step just because it's it's just going to be more of the same thing. Um, that's a little bit more confusing. All right, so um, so we need to get a process handle to a process, and that process should be running in the NT authority system context, at least in our use case that we're doing right now. You, an attacker could impersonate any user. Um, NT authority system just tends to be 
the primary target, or at least the canonical target of this of this type of attack, but it doesn't have to be the system account. So um, it would be potentially short-sighted of us to assume that it has to be NT authority system, but that's just in this particular use case who we want to target, okay? And one thing that it says, again, this goes back to the access rights that we talked about last week, is that the, the process must have the process query limited information access permission. Okay, so that's an access right that we're going to have to make sure that the handle has when we request the handle. Okay. Next, we have the desired access, which is going to be an access mask that specifies basically what type of access we want for the token. So remember, here we're opening a handle to a token. And so there's access masks or access rights that we need for the token. But then there's also, in this case, the access rights that we need for the process handle. Okay. Um, now, you might ask, what access rights do we need? And we can we can actually go back to impersonate logged on user, which tells us, again, we have to have the token query access right, and we have to have the token duplicate access right, okay? So when we go back to open process token, we see that the process handle has to have process query limited information. And then we know that the desired access rights in this case are token query and token duplicate, right? Okay. So then the next question might be something like, how do we get a process handle, right? And uh, Johnny just shared Justin Bowie's, uh, or Johnny or Luke, somebody, just shared Justin Bowie's uh, blog post. So that's that's down there. Go check it out. He does a great job explaining this. And it's going to give you a little bit more information about some alternative methods of impersonation. So maybe kind of get some advanced reading for the next session, potentially. Okay, so... Next thing we're going to do is go and look at the, it recommends, the documentation recommends that we go and see the process security and access rights page. So we'll go and check that out. And I kind of already gave away the answer here, but this is going to tell us about all the different access rights. If you are if you remember from the last session when we talked about access rights, this may look familiar. So remember, uh, we could do things like create a thread, duplicate a handle, query information about the process. And then we have process query limited information, which is what we're particularly interested in. Now you might uh, be asking questions about, um, hey, what type of, what function do we call to get this process handle? Actually, I just noticed a, in Justin's blog post, Johnny brought this up before the, before the session. Um, Justin's blog post talks about how the Microsoft documentation is incorrect and how they say that you need process query information, but you actually only need process query limited information. Now here I want you to see process query information, they specifically reference open process token, which we just saw, but uh, there's actually a discrepancy, right? Because here it says you need process query limited information, but here it tries to associate that function with process query information. And generally speaking, process query information is a more restricted access right than process query limited information. Hence the name limited, I, I suppose. But uh, just kind of an interesting thing. You always got to be careful about trusting the documentation. It usually is a good guide, but don't take it at face value. Kind of play around with it and try to mess around with what type of access rights you need. Okay, so how do we get a process handle? Well, one way that you could get a handle is by calling create process, but that's going to be in the context of like, we're creating a new process. And when you create that new process as the creator, you, you receive a handle as the output value. But in this case, we want to open a handle to an existing process. And so we're going to call the open process function, uh, which is here, right? And so we kind of go into the same, the same thing, right? So again, opens an existing local process object. So again, existing being the keyword. And we see it returns a handle. So this, this acts a little bit differently. We don't just get a bool, Boolean value. We get a handle. And then we have to specify the desired access, which is going to be according to open process token documentation process query limited information, right? There's a inherit handle. So again, this is a Boolean type. And so that's what this B stands for, inherit handle. And then we have a D word. So a D word is an unsigned 32-bit uh, integer. So just a, just a numerical value. Um, that represents the process identifier for the process that you want to open a handle to, okay? Um, one key aspect for those that maybe have used uh, Mimikatz, if you've ever run into a situation where uh, when you when you use the like the Securlsa logon passwords module or command in Mimikatz, you may have run uh, like is it Securlsa deb like enable debug or something like that? It's a debug uh, no privilege debug. Yeah, so privilege colon colon debug. 
Yeah. That's going to enable the SE debug privilege. And so we could actually look into like the documentation tells us potentially why that's happening, right? And so what it says is if the caller has enabled the SE debug privilege, the requested access is granted regardless of the contents of the security descriptor. So remember, a process is a securable object, which means that it has a security descriptor. And within the security descriptor is something called the DACL, the discretionary access control list. We talked about this maybe two sessions ago, right? And that, that DACL is going to define circumstances where users can either be uh, allowed access to the object or circumstances in which the user is going to be denied uh, access to the object. Now, what this is saying is that if the user or the user's token has the SE debug privilege enabled, they just skip that check and they get whatever they asked for. So that's that's one of the reasons why a lot of times uh, attack tools will add the debug privilege because it just gives them, you know, open open season on the on the process. Okay. Johnny, you want to add anything about open process before we Nope. We go. Okay. So again, what we really need here is the process ID. And I I don't necessarily know that off the top of my head because um uh, we, we know that we're interested in win logon, but we don't know the process ID for win logon on the specific system that we're that we're interacting with, right? So the name is going to be consistent, but the process ID is different on every system. It's actually different every time you reboot the system, the process ID will be will be different. So it's relatively unpredictable. There's like no way for us to really predict that. And so there's actually as um, there's actually a series of API functions that we would use to enumerate um, enumerate processes and look for the process that's named when log on and things like that. Again, we have a limited amount of time, so we want to we're going to skip over that because it's a little bit more complicated. We're actually just going to we're going to do this all in PowerShell. We're going to write a, a tool. And we're going to use PowerShell's git, git process commandlet. And that's a little bit more complicated. Maybe one, one day we'll have a session that kind of digs into how PowerShell commandlets actually work under the hood and how they interact with the API. And maybe we'll use git process as the example for that. But uh, for now, we're just going to kind of skip over that. But what we found is we kind of have like a three function chain, right? So we want to call impersonate logged on user, right? But that requires a handle to a token. So then we said, okay, well, how do we get that handle to the token? Well, we have to call open process token, right? And open process token requires a, pro uh, a process handle. And so then we said, how do we get a process handle? Well, we're going to call open process. And that's going to give us a process handle. In order to do that, we need the process ID, right? Um, and so that's, that's kind of the flow that we're going to follow uh, here in PowerShell. Okay. so. Before we uh, go any further, what we're going to be using is this uh, PowerShell module that I, I wrote, and I, I used, I built it on top of Matt Graber's PS Reflect um, PowerShell module. And so PS Reflect is just a PowerShell module that allows you to use a technology in PowerShell called Reflection. And without getting into too much detail, what that allows you to do is to interact in memory with the Windows API. So PowerShell is built on .NET, and .NET is a managed language. And what that what that means is that you don't have direct access to all the APIs and all that kind of stuff. It it kind of handles a lot of that for you. Um, but sometimes, you know, especially when we're talking about infosec use cases, we want access to some things that aren't built into uh, .NET itself, and we want to extend its capability. And uh, PS Reflect is a basically a PowerShell module that lets you do that. The reason why Matt created it in the first place was he was doing a lot of nefarious stuff. And uh, there's actually a supported functionality in PowerShell called add type. It's a, it's a commandlet that allows you to compile C sharp code on the fly and integrate it into your PowerShell session. But what Matt found was that there's uh, that compilation leaves a bunch of disk artifacts that could be messy and could be a good source of detection. And so he created PS reflect to kind of skip past that compilation because it's not actually necessary, technically speaking. And so it's a little bit, this is PS Reflect was just kind of a quieter way, you could say, of, of doing the same thing. And then what I found is that interacting with PS Reflect required a relatively high level of uh, kind of background and experience. And so what I did is I created a module that was built on top of it that kind of added a bunch of capability that, that, you, that you would be building anyway. So it's like, why do I need to redo this every single time? I could just do it once and make it available. And now it's a PowerShell module that allows you to have kind of direct access to a bunch of API functions. So that's, and it, it, it I use it mostly. It, it actually gets flagged by like Defender. So it's not something you're going to use much on um, like live systems or anything, but I use it just to kind of become familiar with API programming. It's just a really easy interface uh, in PowerShell to do that. 
Okay. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to kind of do it long form. And so what we're going to do is we're first going to get uh, when log on. So again, I said we're going to use the git process uh, commandlet in PowerShell. And so this is git process just lists out all of the processes. But you can specify the name of the process that you want to pull. And you can just, you just do this, right? And so then we can go and look at the results of when log on. And we see that there's two when log on. So there's actually like, I'm already peed into this system. And so there's, there's always like a when log on for the console access, but then there's going to be a when log on for any additional uh, terminal session. That an RDP would be one example of that. So we have, we have two when log ons. Um, it actually doesn't matter which one we interact with, but we just have to interact with one of them, right? And the way that I'm going to specify that is by using some notation that allows us to reference one object in the array. So we have an array of process objects and I'm only interested in the first one, right? Um, and so we could do that. And so now we've returned just one process, right? Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call open process, okay? And so again, the PowerShell module PS reflect functions just has this built in. So it's just, we're just gonna treat it like a PowerShell function. And the cool thing is you have tab completion, right? So you just do a dash push tab and it, it's gonna uh, help you out. You also have things like, um, I hope I'm not gonna be a liar because I didn't practice this before, but you could do help and it's going to describe to you what how it works, right? So you you could specify the process ID and the desired access and all, all that kind of stuff, okay? So I'm just gonna clear that real quick. And I'm again, I'm gonna show us when log on here. And now what I'm gonna do is open process and then process ID. So we're gonna do when log on, and then we're gonna do zero. And there's a parameter or a, a field or property called ID, and we're just gonna specify that. And then we're gonna specify desired access. Does anybody, uh, this is mostly for you, Johnny. Uh, does anybody remember what the desired access that we need in order to run this? Eventually we wanna call open process token and open process token tells us we need something. Type of access, right? Query limited information. Query limited information. Yep, exactly. And so if we, in case we wanted to, you know, verify that, we go back to our open process token documentation, look at the process handle um, parameter, which is what we're getting, right? And we're going to see process query limited information, right? And so we could specify process query limited information. And that's all that's all we need and i'm just going to store that again in h process okay. Okay. now we could like johnny said we could verify that we actually have a process val value and here it's just 1804 so that like it's just a numerical value that represents the process handle um, so don't get too caught up in what that means if it was like zero that would be bad but it, as long as it's non-zero then we we can assume that we have a process handle okay so then we're going to call open process token, right? And we're going to do the same thing, right? So we're going to pass in our process handle, and then we have to specify our desired access. And this time we, we could refer back to the um, impersonate logged on user documentation and see what specific access rights we need, right? And so it says if the H token is a primary token, and again, we talked about primary tokens being the token that's associated with the process itself, right? Not the thread. And so in this case, we know we're interacting with a primary token. And so we could, uh, we need to have token query, right? And token duplicate access. And so we could use that. We could come back here and we could just say token query and token duplicate. Okay. And we're gonna store that in H token. All right. And then one thing that I just like to do. Now, Jared, quick question. Why yep. are you storing the token as a return value in H token instead of the Boolean value? Yeah, so that, um, good question. So again, I'll just go back real quick. So when we look at open process token, the output type is a Boolean, right? And actually the token is supposed to be returned as the third parameter. Um, when I made PS reflect functions, I just kind of, I cheated a little bit to where this all this this parameter happens transparently. Just that it's it's not that like it's one of those things that is just kind of hard to do in PowerShell and it's a pain in the butt and there's like not very much you could do with it. And so I just did it automatically for you behind the scenes. 
So that's a good good observation, Johnny, that it's supposed to be a Boolean, but this time I was outputting the token. And that's just a PS reflect functions ism as opposed to how it actually works. And we could um, actually, we could potentially look at that. So we could go into adv advanced API 32. We could go and see open process token. This is the actual function. And so all it's doing here is um, we see this H token. So where is that coming from? So here I'm initializing H token and then I'm passing it in by reference as the third parameter to open process token. And then what I'm doing is I'm just saying, hey, like the output is going to be success. And then I say, hey, if it wasn't successful, I need you to throw the error and give me what the error value is. But if it was successful, then just give me the token as the output. So that's this is like what's actually happening. And this actually matches uh, the function definition, basically. Good observation. OK, so where were we? Oh, OK. So I wanted to look at the current user, get current. And then we could do, is it username? Or I mean, it's just name. Uh... name whatever we'll just do that okay so, oh, right now okay we're gonna do this real quick apparently i just was using some random uh partial <laughs> window and so we're just gonna do this all again just to kind of show that we weren't cheating right so apparently we were running as system so that's something that you should check beforehand okay, so we got win log on then i'm just going to reopen the process i'm going to reopen the token and then I'm just going to prove that I did that as the administrator. So this is not system. Um, I guess it's good that we that we did that test real quick. Yeah. Okay. And then the last thing we have to do is call imp impersonate logged on user. And we need to pass in the token handle. Okay. And now, and it's called name, like Johnny said. So we can do dot name. And now we see that we're running as NT authority system. Okay. So we went from being dev ida is just the name of the computer so it's just a local user but it's the local administrator account and now we're running as the nt authority system account okay so that that just shows that we're able to kind of follow the api documentation and we created a little tool that allowed us to steal a token and like a lot of if you're not a developer and you're not familiar with how apis work you may have assumed that Git system, I know that I thought this, Git system is, you thought it, you may have thought that it was way more complicated than it actually is. It's just three functions and we just call them. They're not very, they're not very difficult, right? And now we are running in the system context and we can now ostensibly access a bunch of resources that we shouldn't have had access to. Yep. A couple of things to keep in mind too is, um, is, Whenever we whenever we got this token, we're sending it to the current thread. So um, I'm not sure, Jared. It's okay if you don't. It, uh, do you have a Git access token on this machine at all? Your PowerShell module. Uh, let's see. Um, so oh. while he's bringing that up, the reason why I ask is um, so he has a really Jared has a really good PowerShell script that basically looks for impersonation tokens running in a thread of processes, and that's just an important note to make here. We have a process that is running, which is PowerShell. And within this PowerShell process, there's many threads. It just so happens that the thread that we're executing under at the moment is now, now has an impersonation token applied to it at the current thread so that whenever this thread executes, it executes under the system um, user, which in case whenever that access is checked to other objects, um, the impersonation token will get checked, not the processes primary token, which is under the administrator user. Um, and that what's what's interesting to keep in mind too is we called three functions and we have one of the most, I mean, Jared, correct me if I'm wrong, token impersonation is extremely hard to detect if you can even detect it. And so we only called three, three functions that the operating system exposes. We're running a system and uh, it's one of the most known and use techniques out there today. And that's what's really cool when it comes to creating or doing these actions is that these we've just shown is that these actions are available because of the functionality and the technology that the operating system exposes to us. And in this case is Windows and in turn has tokens that we can grab and we can impersonate. And you might ask like, why is impersonation a thing? Well, the operating system actually does impersonation a lot. And so someone just realized that this was happening and these these functions are available to us. And so if the operating system can do it, 
we can do it as well. And it, it might benefit us in some way because of that. Yeah. And real, real quick, um, to build on Johnny's thing. So we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to give this information out yet because the conference hasn't, uh, formally announced it, although it's on the website. Um, but if you made it 45 minutes into our, into our live stream, you deserve the information. So Johnny and I got accepted to give a workshop, which is going to be, which, which is called uh, malware morphology for detection engineers. It's going to be a three hour workshop at NorthSec, which is a conference in Montreal. I think it's May 18th and 19th. It's going to be one of those two days for us. I think if you attend the conference, the workshop is free. Um, so if, if you have time and are in Montreal, it'd be awesome to see you. But we're going to go into this type. We're going into access token manipulation or token impersonation extraordinarily in depth. So it's going to be the equivalent of, um, I don't know, five live streams, essentially. Right. We're going to dig into this thing. We're going to give you tons of information, some hands on hands on labs. Um, and and hopefully we, we can kind of work through it. And when Johnny says it's hard to detect token impersonation, we're going to explain exactly why he can make that that statement. So it's not just something that he feels it's hard. We, we have a system that allows us to determine and predict how you might detect different procedures or different variations of attacks. And we're going to, we're going to explain exactly why you can't actually see the behavior very well, uh, through a traditional EDR approach. Um, and then we'll talk about maybe some alternative ways that you might detect that. Yep. Yeah. And that's a good, that's a good point too, is um, we, whenever we say like things like hard and, and things like that, it's um, a lot of the majority of the time it's because Jared and I have spent like hours trying. <laughs> and so it's like, we've built out this framework now that we're going to kind of introduce at this like workshop where we go in depth on multiple, like on this technique specifically. And we have processes that we follow methodology that is possible and things like that, that we try to showcase. Um, and so that's why I mentioned it is, it is incredibly hard to, to detect this. Specifically. One thing I will say is three hours is not very much time to talk about something based on the fact that we're 48 minutes in and I yeah. finally, <laughs> yeah. finally stole the token. So, um, yeah. yeah, we'll see how it goes, but like, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty proud of where we're at. We're still building out the content, uh, but we've built out the framework and I think it's probably one of the better things that Johnny and I have, have produced. So, um, if you're around for Norsec, check that out. If not, we may give it in the future as a specter ops thing or, um, maybe we'll give it at other conferences, but we're looking forward to doing that May 18th and 19th. And there's always a good excuse to go to Montreal and eat some poutine. So, um, feel free, feel free to check it out. It'll be my first time. So I'm excited. So, yep. Yep. All right. So, okay. So where are we at? We, we're running as, um, the system account, right? And now what we could do is we could go back to impersonate logged on user. And again, it said the impersonation lasts until the thread exits, right? So we'd have to basically kill the process or until it calls revert to self. And so let's click on that and see what that is. So revert to self is a function and it's actually one of the easier functions because it has no parameters. So revert to self has an output type, which is bool and there's no parameter. So you just call it and it, it magically, magically works. So again, Here's a list. So a process should call revert to self after finishing any impersonation begun by begun by using the DDE impersonate client, impersonate DDE client window, impersonate logged on user, impersonate name pipe client, impersonate self, impersonate anonymous token, or the set thread token function. So there's also RPC impersonate client, RPC revert to self, so on and so forth. So one thing that you should be noticing, and you could actually, as an attacker or as a defender, you can start to think about alternative variations to this attack by reading the documentation because it's it's saying that there's, what is this, uh, seven, seven different functions or eight if you include RPC impersonate client that would allow you to do impersonation. That's just what they added to the documentation. Now, that doesn't mean that all of these would be valid to use in, an, in a kind of intrusion scenario, but it is something that... You, like we should probably act as if they are until we prove that they're not, right? That's kind of that's kind of the approach that that I like to take. You want to add anything before I go and revert my PowerShell? No, I'm afraid I'm going to let it slip of what I'm going to go into okay. next. Yeah, yeah. Screen, so. Just shut up. Just shut up. <laughs> yeah, okay. Exactly. All right. So all we have to do, I already did this uh, really quick because I messed up the demo and was already running that system. But all we have to do is run revert to self, and nothing nothing happens. But if we go and check what user we are, 
we're now running as the administrator again. So like we could just keep going back, back and forth in system and administrator. So just to kind of show how easily that, that actually happens. Okay. So, um, I think that's, that's all we really had planned, uh, for this live stream. What we really wanted to do was introduce API functions, how to read the API function documentation that Microsoft provides to us. We wanted to introduce the idea that functions actually are used in chains, right? So you like, there's always a goal, right? Which is, I want to impersonate the system account, but you don't just, you don't have everything off jump to be able to do that, right? You have to actually go through and establish the dependencies. You have to work your way up to it. And that actually gives us multiple opportunities for detection because one of the fundamental principles of detection is that the things that you can see are actions being taken against securable objects, right? So you have uh, process create. A process is a securable object and a create is a, an action taken against the process. Process access is Sysmon even ID 10, for instance. That is a opening of a handle to a process, which is one of the things that we did in this example. Um, you're opening a handle to a token. You're doing, you're impersonating a logged on user, whatever that does. That's a little bit more complicated and we'll get into that in the next, in the next live stream. But these functions are being strung together and that's how we should start to think about um, different attacks, different variations of attacks. So one of the things that you could do is you could take a tool, right? any tool, uh, it could be Rubius and one of the, one of the commands within Rubius, it could be some standalone tool like out mini dump. It could be, it could be cobalt strike. And maybe you look at one of the commands that's built into cobalt strike. Uh, one of the, one of the ideas is that you have tools and then you have, uh, suites, right? And a suite is like a, a, what appears to be a, a single tool, but it has a bunch of different capabilities kind of inside of it. You want to be thinking about things as individual capabilities. So you want to think about things atomically. And the question that you should be asking are, what are the functions that this thing is calling and how does it chain those together? And what are the inputs and outputs of each function and why somebody's doing that? Because their goal may be to call impersonate logged on user, but in order to do that, they have to call these other three things first. And the, all those other three things actually give you something to detect as well. And so you, um, they, may be, they may be extraordinarily valuable to know what that chain looks like. Johnny. No, yeah, I don't have anything else on that. Again, um, I think what I think what we're trying to show here today is um, as we start to bring up new technologies on the operating system, like we talked about access rights, right? That's super important because like we literally could not have talked about APIs unless we talked about access rights first um, and scribble objects. You even saw today that we um, reached uh, a technology that we haven't even really talked about, and that's privileges, system privileges, which is a is another form of check when it comes to access, um, but we haven't talked about that quite yet. And there's even more than that, right? Um, but these things build on top of each other, These knowledge, this knowledge does, um, in order to be successful in whatever action we wanna do. And so um, we wanna make sure that we understand these things as we start to build on top of each other because they're gonna start to like commingle essentially. Um, mm. and, and then that's the really cool thing. Awesome, yeah, so it's, uh... You can't you can't sprint before you can crawl, right? Yep. So we got to make sure that we learn some of the fundamentals. One of the things that I like to say is uh, you can't detect what you don't understand. Yep. Right. And and your your understanding of something is going to represent the limit of your detection capability. Um, and so the better you understand something, maybe the better your the possible the more possibilities open up to you. So uh, that's something that we just really need to keep in mind. And with that, assuming Johnny and Luke don't have anything else, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you uh, to M45CO7 for commenting early, uh, being the first one on the stream. And thanks to Andrew, who also also joined us a little bit late, but we still appreciate you, man. Um, and hopefully we'll see everybody two weeks from now uh, when we do our next live stream. And be sure to check out our long form interviews, especially the one with Olaf um, that was released last Monday. I got a lot of good feedback on that uh, live stream or on that that long form interview as being really valuable for a few people. So uh, always, always a pleasure with Olaf. And uh, thanks, everybody, for checking us out. Thank you, Roddy. See you guys in two weeks.